from the heart of rural France. This is the Keto Woman podcast, brought to you by me. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. I've been keto now for over two years and it has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs under 20 grams a day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like full fat dairy. Choose delicious fatty proteins and be free and easy with oily dressings on salad and butter on your veggies. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalized keto. You'll hear all sorts of ways to keto from my guests. There is no one way to do keto, no one size fits all. I hope to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we really can't give you medical advice. It's always best to consult your own doctor when making big changes to your diet and lifestyle because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Wouldn't it be helpful to have one place where you could find all the links? Want to sign up to my new Patreon exclusive Facebook group, Daisy's Lovelies? No problem. How about subscribing to my YouTube channel? Please help me notch up my first thousand subscribers by going to links.ketowomanpodcast.com and following the YouTube link. Not following me on Instagram yet? Hit the Instagram button. You get the idea. All the buttons, all the links you need are at links.ketowomanpodcast.com. Thank you for tuning in to episode number 149, where I am joined by extraordinary woman Gail Straker. Gail has taught math in all grade levels in public schools and has trained co-workers through workforce development. She believes that teaching is a lifetime endeavor and that it is a two-way street. Teachers learn as much from their students as the students learn from the teacher. In August 2017, Gail hiked the Grand Canyon rim to rim, and while on that three-day hike, she had a health scare and wasn't sure she was going to make it. She climbed out of that canyon and promised herself that she would focus and get healthy. The following month, she started on her keto journey and has spent the last three years finding out which biohacks work for her, regaining her health, and sharing her knowledge with family and friends. In 2019, she discovered that she has lipedema, using the wonderful resources from lipedemasimplified.org. She is now in the process of becoming a certified advisor through the Noakes Foundation, and she continues to be inspired by the leading experts in the low-carb community. Inspired by Daisy, <clears throat> that's me, and her own daughters, she has recently started journaling, striving for mindfulness, and stepping outside of her comfort zone. By doing so, she has found the confidence to start on a new career path at age 60. She is excited that she has been given the opportunity to join the staff of Lipedema Simplified as a mentor and soon-to-be coach. It was a great pleasure to add another lovely Lipedema lady to my ever-growing list of extraordinary women. I think it is such an important disease to increase awareness for, and keto has proved so very helpful for many who have it. I hope you enjoy Gail's story of fierce determination and share her passion for keto and all the magic it can bring. Welcome, Gail, to the Keto Woman podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Daisy. Thank you very much. It's nice to meet you finally. And you too. 
We see each other, speak to each other on Facebook and whatnot, but it's it's nice to be here with you. Well, almost in person, across the web waves person. Across the world person. <laughs> exactly. Right. You're quite a ways <laughs> away from me. I am. The wonders of modern day technology. <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? It is. How you can have these chats with people from anywhere, anywhere in the world, as long as they've got internet. It is quite amazing. And I'm, and I've always, every morning when I journal, I always write, I am grateful for technology. <laughs> That's part of your morning ritual, is it? Journaling? Yes, it, it is. I used to kind of poo poo it. I didn't give too much credit to it. And about, Six weeks ago, I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll give it a try. And I love it. Mm. Just gratitude journal. I usually write down my statistics, what my blood sugars are, or what my ketone levels are. And then underneath that, I just start writing what I'm grateful for, what I'm thankful for, and what I discovered about myself the day before. The discovery thing came in about two weeks afterward. I just developed it on my own. Mm. I'm a little bit of a rebel. And so I don't follow the rules. Like if someone were to give me a list, oh, journal about these things, I would probably just answer the opposite of what <laughs> what it was asking for. Because I have a little bit of a rebellious streak. Mm, same here. <laughs> yeah. I've heard you say that. <laughs> it's been better just for me to just start writing what I'm grateful for. And it's been nice. It's helped me a lot. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? It was the first Monday Mindset episode that I did was about gratitude journaling. And I remember the first time I did it was life changing. It was just a gratitude exercise where you write down three things you're grateful for each day. And it really changed my general perspective on life. But interestingly enough, I redid it when I did that podcast episode. And I, I guess because my perspective had already changed from the first time of doing it, that it, I felt there was something lacking with that. So yeah, I kind of developed it as well. I think it's good these things where you, you just, you just need a starting place and then you let it go where, where it wants to go. So you, you know, you can be talking about what you're grateful for, but I love that, you know, what you've discovered about yourself and maybe unburdening things that have troubled you that day, whatever it is, but free flowing. Right. And it's really interesting because for me, I can discover things about myself all of a sudden, that people have been telling me about myself <laughs> for years. Mm. And I'm like, oh, I do have something to give to my community. While my family's like, mom, you're always involved with the community. And then all of a sudden, I realize, yes, and I have something to give. It's helped me develop a sense of myself rather than just being mom or wife or teacher or whatever it is, that I'm, I'm developing a sense of gale. Mm. And I'm loving that. It's like, it's about time, you know, after all these years. And <laughs> that I'm finally finding a way to develop a sense of me. And during that time, I'm also finding the way to love myself. So often you hear people just say, oh, you need to start loving yourself. We don't know how. We can read a book about how, but it's still not taking the process of learning who we are and recognizing who we are so that ourselves recognize ourselves. And this tiny little one-page journaling process that I've just started working for myself has given me that. I have two daughters in their 30s, and they're both avid journalers. One says, Mom, I'm so happy that you're able to do this. And the other one says, Wow, Mom, that just blows my mind that you haven't been doing this for years. Mm -hmm. Because for them, it's just part of their daily lives, and it has been for years. So I'm really grateful that I've been able to learn how to do this. And I might have started doing it about the time that you started the other, the Mindful Mondays. 
that might have been what kicked me in. Monday I, mindset. Yeah. yeah the mindset. It's about then. Yeah, that sort of time. Yeah. Because mm. I've been listening to you for for a long time and following you on the on Facebook for a long time. And you always inspire me. Oh, good. <laughs> That's nice to hear. I love that. That's a great question. Yeah, what did I discover about myself? It's funny, isn't it? If you ask the right questions, right. then you, it just changes your perspective and you start looking for different things. And, and as you said, that's a great way in to learning about yourself. And as you do that, yeah, so it's a great step towards actually having more self-love and being able to, yes. to self-care more. Yes, Like you say, a lot of us find that very difficult. We do as, I don't know if it's just a human trait or if it's as women, how we're trained at a very young age by watching our moms mm. not loving themselves and we love them so we emulate them and we hear them say they say sharp words about themselves in our presence and i think that when that happens as a young person here's this wonderful beautiful woman that we love saying sharp words about herself while she's either looking in the mirror or she's doing something. And we model ourselves after that. And so we, we can't express our love for ourselves comfortably, even know how to. If our moms haven't been able to express that self-care and that love. Mm. I heard somebody say that years and years and years ago. I mean, decades ago. And I thought, yeah, well, I, I'm doing that in front of my kids. And I didn't know how to stop. My youngest daughter, she will tell me, Mom, don't please stop saying that about yourself. You know, I love you. You're my friend. I would not want any of my friends to say that about themselves. Mm. She lives with me and um, watches me daily, watches over all the, <laughs> all the things I do daily. And... Um, she brings it up in a gentle manner. You know, mom, you, you might want to think about saying that in a different way. You might want to try again so that you can say that in a positive way about yourself. So it's, it's a, that's great. Yeah. She's, she's been a, a very strong influence in my life, which seems a little bit opposite that, you know, moms are influences for their children. And here my children are influences for me. I'm learning as much as I can now, hopefully, that they learned from me as, as young people. I was listening to something the other day, and they were talking about parenting. It might have even been Brene Brown. I can't remember. But it was to do with the job, if you like, of parenting and how it, it never ends and you keep learning as a parent. And I can see that I'm not a parent myself. So I can't speak from experience. But I can imagine that part of that experience is seeing the dynamic change as your children get older, as your children develop into adults, and bring their own wisdom to situations and that you start learning from them, you were the teacher, but it becomes a process that goes both ways. Very interesting. It does. And in fact, the daughter that, so I have three children and my son is almost 40 and is a, is a fabulous parent. And it took him quite a while to develop into an amazing parent. My middle daughter doesn't have children. And then my youngest daughter has a three and a half year old. My youngest daughter and her wife and her three and a half year old all live with us. That's nice in a happy little home. I mean, it's, mm. you know, it's pretty small and it's pretty full. And watching my, my youngest daughter and her wife parent their daughter is just amazing. Sometimes I find myself saying things like, oh, I wish I would have had that little nugget when my kids were young because I can see where it's going. Mm. And that's the thing about technology. These women are learning things online on how to parent their child. 
my daughter would say, mom, what did you do when you met this situation? And I said, I played it by ear. I just did what I thought had to happen. And she, she shakes her head sometimes like, wow, because I didn't have the resources that my girls have now. Mm. So I'm always impressed at what good parents they are. And I get to watch it every day. And I love that. And I step back. I follow the rules as a grandmother because I don't want to interfere with their amazing journey, raising their kids. The daughter, can I say your name? Allison. My daughter, Allison, has been on all of my health journeys with me, whether it's through getting movement going in my life or nutrition-wise with keto. She's been there with me. And now for taking care of my inner child, Mm -hmm. she's right there with me. And I'm so grateful for her, for her always stepping up and either saying, Mom, that upset me. Without us having a fight, we can see what happens. Or, Mom, I love you and I'm grateful that, that you said this or you did this. So she's been teaching me a lot. It's been quite the amazing stay-at-home journey right now. Mm, It sounds like it. A great opportunity to learn a lot. I think you're right when you mentioned about it potentially being a female trait, about putting yourself down and things like that. But I I think it's a female thing that we have a tendency of thinking of ourselves as the other the mother, the daughter, the wife, the whatever it is, rather than thinking of ourselves. And so it, it's fantastic that you've you've been exploring that and finding yourself. Yes. Talking of that, <laughs> we got a little bit sidetracked with, with all sorts of things <laughs> there. We've kind of sort of jumped to the end a bit. Uh, so let's go back okay. and hear your story here, where you were at before you got to this wonderful place you're in now. I've always considered myself, I've always been recognized as kind of the fat girl. Was that right from an early age? Or? From an early age. Mm. I can remember as young as 11 years old, maybe even younger, knowing that I was big, uh, probably seven or eight, knowing that I was big. I'd get hand me down clothes from my cousins. And they wouldn't fit. I was bigger than my cousins who were five, seven years older Mm. than me. They were little, they were slender, tiny people. And I was not, I was large. And I know even by the time I was 12 years old, I remember on my 12th birthday, getting on the scales to discover just how big I was. And I weighed 169 pounds and I was five foot six. And I wore a size 10 shoe. I was large. I was in a small community. And so I was the fat girl. There were 13 kids in my, in my grade at school. And I was, I was picked on. And I was always wondering why, why it was me that out of everybody, why, how did I do that? You know, so it was like me. I was like, what did I do to become this way? And I was about 11 years old when I started dieting. And so when I turned 12, I thought, oh, I'm going to be smaller than I thought I was. And I wasn't. The numbers were so big at the time to my brain because everybody else was so small in comparison. My mom was really big on trying to find nutritional ways to handle things. She actually read a book called Sugar Blues at the time. And so she got my family off sugar while that quote unquote fad was going on in our lives. We didn't eat sugar. And I found myself getting smaller. I could actually fit my hips into the bell bottoms and stuff that I couldn't wear before because this was during the early 70s. So I couldn't, I couldn't wear those cute styles or anything. So I just wore boy pants. Mm. I went through my late junior high 
and my high school years, fairly slender in an American size 12. And that was about as small as I got. I got married at 18 and I met the most wonderful woman in the world, my mother-in-law. And she had food groups called Pepsi was one food group <laughs> and Oreos was another food group and Fritos was another food group because he Fritos has corn in it. So that's a vegetable and Oreos have cream in the middle. So it was dairy and then Pepsi was just Pepsi. And I fell in love with junk, not food, but yeah, I know now, but it was like, this is amazing because of all this sugar and starch and grease and you name it. And it was like phenomenal. Needless to say, I, I no longer ate no sugar, right? I, I ate everything under the sun and I had issues and I started gaining weight rather quickly. So from about the time I was 18 years old and got married to two years later, I gained about 150 pounds. There was no stopping it. I also had gotten pregnant, had a baby during that time, and didn't lose any weight after the baby. I just, it never stopped. I also discovered at that time that my body changed to shapes. I was no longer an hourglass shape with a smaller waist, and I was more like a huge pear. So my bottom, my upper legs, from my knees to my waist, got very large. And my upper arms got really large. So from my elbows to my shoulders, got very large, and I could no longer wear regular clothes. I had to start making my clothes again. So my mom had taught me how to sew, you know, as a child. So I started having to add inches to my sleeves and I started having to widen out my pants in my clothes. I always had to extend the rise to get it up over my rump and I had to narrow the waist down. So I had really changed shape and my legs got really heavy, heavy, not only size wise by looking at them, but heavy like hard to carry around. Mm. They became full. They didn't feel like they were full of liquid, but they felt like they were just full of solid, like a mass, these massive legs. And I started slowing down. I couldn't keep moving all the time. I, like I said, I dieted since I was 11. I dieted off and on, off and on. And I would get fatigued from dieting. I'd have to put so much effort into it. So I would diet for several months, lose some weight, become just absolutely emotionally fatigued from focusing on dieting and losing weight for so long. And I would give up. What was your diet like before as a child? I mean, you, you mentioned that your mother took you all off sugar, which great fad diet to go on, by the way, <laughs> if you're going to choose <laughs> right? a fad diet, that's the one to choose. Right. But what was your diet like before? How much basically was diet an influence on what your body was like, the excess weight that you were carrying? Or was it something else entirely? Well, we ate meat and beans and potatoes and vegetables didn't have a lot of fruit, except can we had a lot of canned fruit. There were canned peaches all the time. There's always cottage cheese. There's always applesauce, peanut butter, jelly, lots of homemade bread. We were farm workers. We were, um, my dad is a cowboy, so we worked on the ranches. So when we had food, it was always in abundance. We didn't necessarily get to grocery shop a lot. But you know, there was always beef in the walk-in. There was always dairy in the in the ranch walk-in. I call it the walk-in. It it's a big cooler, like a commercial cooler, that had a half a beef hanging in there, and they'd have half a, you know, it, it was like it was just like a huge walk-in refrigerator, mm. and there was always food in there, and and we were allotted 
we just write out what we took out of the stores there. And then we would go grocery shopping for canned goods. And we would buy mostly canned vegetables like peas and carrots and corn, very starchy vegetables. And we also had peaches. <laughs> I say we had canned peaches. We had canned peaches a lot. So it was always homemade things. Like we baked a lot, a lot of homemade cookies. My mom got into a muffin kick one time where we made muffins, all the, um, the breads, not the yeast breads, but like zucchini bread and carrot bread, applesauce bread. It was always bread, 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 bread. Very starchy, but as farm workers, as, as ranch workers, it never showed up on my brother or my parents. They were always busy out there working on the ranch, burning everything off. And for me, I was the stay-at-home person. I had the home chores. I was responsible for taking care of the house, and I was responsible for the yard. They were responsible for working out on the ranch. So the food was always there for me. They'd come home for lunch, and I'd have lunch ready. And it was always a lot of potatoes, a lot of noodles. I learned how to make noodles as a kid. There was always a lot of starch, and then there was meat. And there was always a pot of beans on the back of the stove. And when I say beans, I mean pintos. Mm -hmm. We lived in Southern California, and my mom learned how to make pintos with a, we call them bacon rinds, but it's the slab that you cut the bacon off of. So that was always in there with the, with the pintos, and they would just simmer on the back of the stove all the time. So we always had a pot of beans on the stove. So that's kind of how we ate very uh, country food, I guess. Yeah, so I mean, it wasn't awful. It wasn't. No. It wasn't highly processed or highly refined, but it was quite starch heavy. Right. But it sounds like there was definitely something different going on with you metabolically that you reacted differently. Because yeah. although you said you know you were the stay at home and did the household chores, but that's still fairly active. Right. You know, might be not quite as active as the farm work, or maybe not quite as high intensity, but that's still a fairly active active life you're leading so right it just kind of says to me that there was there was something metabolically going on from the get-go I believe there was I feel like my mom like the generation that my mom was in and that the generation that I was raised in to be a mom myself that there was some disservice done to the children I never had breast milk ever. Mm. The five kids in my family, actually there's six of us, we never had breast milk. We were given formula that they made. And so my first my first meal was sugar because they used to make it out of caro syrup and condensed milk. They used to make formula for babies in the early 60s and the 50s. And so my mom never breastfed any of us, so we were all given formula, um, basically sugar from the time we were born. Mm. My other sibling have had diabetes or metabolic issues before mine actually showed up in blood work. All of my sibling had already dealt with metabolic issues and things. I've always thought it was because we started off with sugar. My mom didn't know that what she was doing was wrong. And then as a mother for myself, I also didn't breastfeed my children. I went directly to formula. And that's one of those things where I wish that my mom and my mother-in-law both had taken a different approach. I mm -hmm. wish that they would have said, yes, gal, breastfeed instead of, oh, go ahead. You know, a bottle's easy for the kids. And formulas are great for the kids. And I know that there are good formulas out there for women who don't have a chance to breastfeed for whatever reason. But for me, it was, I didn't even consider it. It was just not an option. And so as I'm looking at my children going through the same thing dietarily, metabolically now that I've gone through, I go, maybe I could have made different choices, but I didn't know how. So that's what I'm doing now with my life 
is I'm helping my children maybe make different choices than I was able to make. Mm. Now, as an, as an older person, having dieted all these years, and I'm hoping that my children don't have to, quote unquote, diet. They can just eat healthy, eat in a way that makes sense for their health rather than constantly struggling and wondering, you know, am I doing it right? I know that for me, the low carb, higher fats, whole foods, much fewer processed foods that our whole family is doing right now has made a difference. I can see it. I can see it in the way my children move. I can see it in the way my children think. And I'm, I'm watching my children go through the same process at a much younger age than the journey I took. Mm. My journey was frantic as I tried to lose weight. I took you off on a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a, a sidetrack there, going back kind of where to where we left off, where you'd gained a lot of weight quickly with your change of diet and a lot of these processed foods that um, yeah, do taste delicious. <laughs> Planned that way. Right. <laughs> you know, the, the evil manufacturers know what they're doing. Um, but yes, yeah, so you, you gained all this weight and, and you mentioned there, obviously, with hindsight, <laughs> this was when presumably your, your lip edema was developing. And right. you said that, that your legs got very heavy and movement became difficult. And so you, you found yourself in a place where you just got a lot bigger and you were you were finding it difficult to move yourself around so yeah what yeah. gave what yes. what changed so i gained all that weight and got really heavy in my 20s and i had i had my children in my 20s in my 30s i went back to college and i got my teaching degree so by the time i was 35 i was teaching and through all of that I tried every diet I could even imagine. <laughs> Weight Watchers, Ginny Craig, Nutrisystem, Slim Fast, Don't Eat Anything But Eggs and Cabbage, um, Body for Life, Forks Over Knives, everything I possibly could think of. And the legs, the hips, the upper arms never changed. I would shrink in my torso and I could only lose about 50 pounds. And then, like I said, I'd get fatigued again. And it was like, this is too hard. Mm. I can't keep going. And it would be six, eight months. Body for life was 18 months. I was, I had gone up to like 330 pounds. I was able to get down to 220. I hiked the Grand Canyon. That was when I was 43. I hiked the Grand Canyon rim to rim, did a great job. I was like 220. I was feeling better than ever before. I got out of that Grand Canyon and I was tired. I didn't have a goal anymore to keep that weight off. And I was tired and I stopped pushing so hard. It was getting harder anyways. And the weight went back on. But my legs, no matter how thin I got, my legs were still huge. And when I say huge, I, it's relative. Hmm. I looked at them and I mean, I was still 220 and most of my weight was in my legs. I was very slender on top. I was like a size 12 on top and I was still wearing a size 18 to 20 on the bottom. So I just continued back and forth. Yo-yo dieting, I guess is what some people call it. Binge eating disorder. I'm pretty sure I had or I have de been developing all my life. I had the opportunity to go back down in the Grand Canyon when I was 57 and I decided I'll do it. And I, it takes about a year to get prepared to go into the Grand Canyon. You have to make reservations way in advance to stay at the Phantom Ranch. So I had a year, year and a half or so to train, to get myself back down to a weight and to a a physical condition to hike the Grand Canyon rim to rim again. Mm. And I started working and I started exercising and I, st I worked with the trainer and I worked and worked and worked and I could not get myself down below 
296 pounds. I was strong. I'd been hiking the mountains. I knew I was ready to go. And I went into the Grand Canyon in August of 2017. We carry a pack with 100 ounces of water. It's like a camelback. You have a bladder. You're able to just take a sip of water when you need right. and keep hiking. Mm -hmm. It's 15 miles from the North Rim to the bottom. And people go down at a, an easy pace of about two miles per hour. So it should take about seven hours if you're just taking it easy. Well, about three miles in, we realized that the faucets that they have, their water replacement faucets, weren't working. Oh no. They had had to turn the water off because a main line burst and they were repairing the water. I'm down there in August in 103, 105 degree heat and I don't have enough water to get to the bottom safely. And I started panicking and that made it worse. It took us 15 hours to get to the bottom instead of seven. Wow overheating and the, as you go down into the canyon it gets hotter right it doesn't get cooler mm. everybody thinks oh it's shady yeah no, it's, yeah you would think that yeah mm. the rocks are hot oh right they, so it you, gets it's like right? an oven mm. it gets hotter and hotter mm. there were people on the trail that had salt tablets and they realized i was in trouble they filtered water they dipped my shirt in creeks that are down there and they kept trying to cool me off. And they got me to the bottom where I could stay at the ranch for a couple of days. And I was better when I climbed out. But that was a changing point in my life. I knew at that time, number one, I put my whole family at risk. Because if they have to carry me out, it makes it harder for them to get out themselves. So I put my hiking party at risk. And it could have been the end of my life down there. It was not wise for me to be in that canyon. And the reasons that I looked at was that there's something with my body I need to do. I need to do something nutritionally to take this weight off and to get healthy again. Because at that point, that was like my low point. And so I started looking through my books that I had here at the house that I trusted the authors of. And the one that I had was Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis. And as I was reading it, and I started researching him online again, he had a 10-day detox. And so I got that book, The 10-Day Detox. And I said, I'm doing this. And in October of that year, I started the Wheat Belly 10-Day Detox. And I never looked back. I gave up wheat and sugar and all grains. And within a month, acid reflux was gone. My ankles were swollen. My blood pressure was normal. I had a fairly high A1C, well, 5.9, I guess, 6 A1C. But it was the first time I'd had my A1C check. And I had already been doing this for a month. I decided, okay, I can eat this way the rest of my life. My family can eat the way they want to. I just separated out when I made meat, I'd separate out the meat, add whatever they had to have with it. And I just separated all my stuff out at the, while I was cooking in advance. I did that October, November. On December 4th, my husband said, I want to join you. My husband didn't have a lot of weight to lose. I couldn't see any weight for him to lose. But he wanted to join me. So he joined me and the journey just kept going. By that time, my daughter who lives with us, Allison, she started eating closer to the same way that we were eating. My husband lost weight. I lost a few pounds, you know, not much, 10, 15 pounds, but it wasn't, it wasn't difficult. It just kind of went off. And then someone on the Wheat Belly Facebook page posted something in there and someone responded with Dr. Fung. And I started thinking, oh, I can look at intermittent fasting. And so I started researching, listening to Dr. Fung. And I went on to the internet, found some YouTube videos, things like that. 
that talked about it. I then started reading his books, all of Dr. Fung's books, and I started incorporating intermittent fasting. That was about February of 2018. I told my husband, I'm going to practice, just practice fasting, see how it works. And within a month, he was fasting with me. We just kept going one step after another. It was probably midsummer. I read Annette Boswell's book, Any Way You Can, and I gave up more um, carbs. I started making my own bone broth. I started fasting for my brain health, not just for weight loss, but for my brain health. So I did that for a while, quite a while. And I do the challenges once in a while where they say, oh, we're going to, you know, no dairy September or something like that. Mm, and try out a few Allison things. And, yeah. Right. Alice and I will do that. And then in the spring of 2019, I thought carnivore sounds really interesting. Mm, I kind of remember that, actually. I remember you, know, you doing like, that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> carnivore. And, you know, all through this, I've been convincing my my son and his wife to follow along with us, and they've done really well with it. My daughter, Allison, is right there with me. She's my researcher. Every now and then she'll send me a link of something, mm -hmm. and she's my researcher and encourages me to try something new. It's great that your whole family gets involved. You know, having, yes. having your partner yeah. want to get involved, it, right. it must make the journey a lot easier. It makes it different. <laughs> it really, it changed when, mm. when they've all kind of gotten involved. Now there are seven adults in my family and there are five of us that do something low carb, high fat, mm. carnivore fasting. And we're, we're in this community together. Once I started carnivore in April of 2019, someone asked me on one of the web pages, have you thought maybe you're, you have lipedema? And I kind of went into denial for about a month and I kept looking at my legs <laughs> and I thought, you know what? Maybe I do. The next time I saw somebody mention lipedema, I decided to check out lipedema simplified.org. Hmm. And that's where I met Catherine Sayo. I attended one of the webinars and I was so convinced that I had lipedema. And I didn't know what to do about it. So I signed up for a free consultation on lipedema, simplified.org. And it was amazing because Catherine is the one that called me. And we had this amazing conversation. She helped me to understand that everything I was doing was right for what I was dealing with mm. and to not give up. But it was the first time that someone actually listened mm. to what I had to say. It was the first time that I didn't feel crazy, that my legs were heavy, that my arms are so big that I have to buy shirts that are too big for me to get my arms in the sleeves, or that I have to always wear stretch, super stretchy fabrics. And no matter how much weight I've lost, my arms are still too big for the clothes. And the legs, you know, they, they just don't shrink very fast. I started getting really involved with lipedema, simplified things that they were doing. I took a, a mini master class from Catherine and the Leslie Keith, Rayanne Sparks, Mindy Staggs. You've had them all mm -hmm. on your Hey, I'm working um, through them all. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I found out lipedema affects 11% mm, of women. A lot of women. But there are not 11% of women's doctors to talk to us about it. Mm. Nobody is out there. I mean, they're getting more now, but nobody is. It's like nobody knows about this or they're just ignoring it. Maybe it's because we're women and we're not screaming loud enough, right? So we have to take care of ourselves now. We have to make people aware of this ourselves because doctors don't go, oh, yeah, you've got lipedema. This is what you need to do. They say, you need to lose some pounds, mm. girl. You're too You're heavy. Fat, lose weight. Yeah, You're yeah. fat, lose mm. weight. You know, you need to exercise mm. more. And we're going, but our legs hurt. 
and they're heavy. Mm. And oh, I can but they wouldn't move. if you lost weight. <laughs> but if you, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, if, you, yeah, yeah. if you just picked up, you know, you just walk a, an extra mile and you're going, I can't make it to the mailbox without paying. Mm. Anyway, so that's how I found out about Lipedema. It has changed my life. I use a vibration plate now to help things get going. I wear compression. I remember used, I used to get out of a car after a road trip. I used to have to have help to get to up the stairs. Or I used to have to have help just to make it into the bathrooms at the rest stops during road trips because my legs would be so full and stiff. I wear compression now all the time when I travel so that that keeps everything moving the direction it needs to go. Mm. And I used to not do that. I've learned that some foods cause inflammation in my legs. And so I avoid those foods mostly as a carnivore. Mostly I avoid most of them anyways, but nuts will do it to me every time. And I'm a nut eating carnivore. I mean, I think nuts are like one of the only plant products I eat, but they, they call me mm. at this point. Allison and I are saying, yeah, mom, you need to stop eating that for a while, <laughs> you know, see how it works. I took a, ma a mini master class. And learned a lot, joined the Lipedema Tribe, which is a, a private Facebook group. You have to belong to the membership to be able to do it. But Lipedema Simplified has several Facebook groups out there mm -hmm. to support people with all of their information. Through all this journey, I became very, I fell in love with the ladies on the team. I. I think I told you I was a teacher. I got my teaching certificate when I was 35. I've taught middle school math and I've taught a lot. And everything I do has been around teaching. And I decided a couple of months ago that maybe I would ask Catherine Sayo if there was a direction I could take to become a coach. So she's been working with me. I'm a mentor for the Lipedema Simplified group now. And I've been taking classes from Professor Timothy Noakes Foundation. They have coursework through Nutrition Network. Mm -hmm. So I've started taking my courses through them to become a coach. And it's just been one adventure after another to not only help myself, to accept help. That was huge. To have my daughter help me, to have my husband help me, to have a community of women with well your facebook page kick our keto bitches i adore the women <laughs> there are amazing they are indeed and then to get the help from the lipedema group all those things and it's just like this is an amazing adventure now that i'm on and i want to share it with everybody it's like i want to share it with everybody <laughs> and then i want to share it with everybody more so it's this is where I am right now, and I don't know where it's going to lead me, except I know it's going to lead me in an upward positive direction with all of this. That's fantastic. It sounds like you're in that real period of change and creativity and self-discovery and forward momentum. It sounds like a really, a really positive space to be occupying it is i have my hard times of i course. do have to admit i've um we've had a year <laughs> in my family um and you know with the covid thing happening and stuff it hasn't made it easy hmm. but none of us have gotten ill which i'm grateful for and even with that i mean i've made about 600 masks and i send them to whoever wants them and i'm saying that now going Okay, <laughs> but you know, I, I've sent them all over the world um, yeah. at this point. Mm -hmm. People just pay me for the shipping pretty much. I've done that, but you know, my daughter in law is who lives with us. She's a teacher. She's been home since March. My husband's been working to come home since March. We have a grandson who is doing all the schoolwork here. So he comes in every day since I think June. He's been here every day. My daughter, Allison, was diagnosed with congestive heart failure almost a year ago. 
And part of our health journey, we have to really make sure she has good nutritious foods and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we've learned a lot about heart health also through all this time. And she ended up getting a pacemaker in February. And so her, her health's gotten better. My father's passed away this year. There's just one thing after another happening this year. So there has been some heavy family issues that we've had to deal with. However, even if I go on a, a sabbatical from staying really focused, grains, sugars, wheat, they don't come in the house mm. for us. The daughter-in-law, she still eats that way. She has her cupboard. That's fine. Holly can have her food in her cupboard. We'll supply it. That's, she eats that way. It's great. But for those of us who are eating keto, carnivore, way of life, we've continued to eat that way. I might not be fasting as often. I might eat a different ratio, but I have not let grain sugars come back into my life. And do you feel that's made you more resilient to the challenges and the hardships you're, you're having to go through? I do. I think it has helped. I think it has helped all of us because we don't have the brain fog. Mm -hmm. We have this purpose of staying healthy. We haven't been sick. There hasn't been a cold in the house in like two years. We haven't gotten sick. I attribute that the low carb, high fat way of eating. Mm. I really do. Because Holly's a teacher. She could bring stuff in and out of this house all the time. She's been sick once or twice, but not like she used to get sick because she doesn't even eat as much of the the processed foods as she used to, mm -hmm. just simply because they're not around and because there's other good foods out here that, you know, in our family. And the little one, the granddaughter, I mean, she loves liverwurst, you know, so we slice it off a <laughs> slab of liverwurst and we give her her pecans with her little pieces of butter in between and she's happy. So all of us are eating in a healthier way. I really do think it's been good for the whole family. And I also think for mentally for me, it's like when I go on a, I went on a binge the other day because I didn't know what else to do with myself. I was stopping around having a, having a moment of just needing something, restlessness. And all I could find to eat in the house was, was walnuts. So I had a walnut binge. <laughs> okay. You know, that's totally different than a cold cereal and Oreo binge. But it was like, okay, a handful of walnuts. I was like needing something. And I found myself in the middle of it going, Okay, gal, you need to, you know, tap or do something, calm yourself down because walnuts aren't going to do the trick, you know. But yeah, I, I think it's helped us a lot. I think all of our brains are working better. Mm. I know that Allison, I don't think, has the migraines that she used to. My husband doesn't seem to have headaches like he used to. I've never been much of a headache person myself. But I know that my husband used to get them and I know Allison used to, it used to be debilitating for her, her migraines. Mm. So I, I do, I think it's all helped. Oh, fantastic. It, it sounds like, yeah, the, the whole family is benefiting in, in many ways from eating this way. Yeah. And like a lot of the people I have on this podcast, it's your passion. And it's also become something that you want to share with everybody else and you want to develop your career in that direction too. That, yes. that seems to happen a lot. It's, I guess it's, it's that need and desire to, to want to help other people. Right. It, it seems like the obvious thing to do. It does. And, you know, I hear people say, well, it's not, you know, it's not this magic pill. It's not this magic bullet, but it is. It's amazing how one step after another, it just keeps on progressing. So maybe it's not a pill like, okay, it's over and done with, but it is a, it's a very magical, fulfilling journey. Once you get started, once you realize that you don't just have to follow, follow the rules. You just don't have to follow what somebody says. And I hear it a lot. I see it a lot. From people, they say, yeah, but what do I do next? 
And I like being able to offer something for people to do next, but I can't tell them, you must do this to be successful. Mm. There are so many different ways that this journey can take. Each one of us is so unique that we can take as our journey goes forward. I never imagined that I would go into the direction I'm going now. All I wanted was to make sure that I was healthy. All I wanted was to make sure that I didn't become a diabetic, full-blown diabetic. That's all I wanted. And I just wanted it for me. And there aren't a lot of things I, I wanted. And I used to always say, oh, someday the doctor's going to tell me exactly what to do and I'll be okay. And it never happened. And when I took it on myself, when I hit that place where it was, it was scary and it was, and I, I knew it was rock bottom. I used to think I never have to hit rock bottom. I'll be fine. Right. I did have to hit rock bottom and I want to be able to help those people who feel that they're there with lipedema ladies. There are so many of us that feel helpless, that feel hopeless that feel like there's no way out of this. And granted, lipedema, lipedema's ours. It's there. It's not going to go away. It's our fat disorder. It's the way our body stores fat and doesn't release it. And we know that, but we can manage it. We can help our legs stop hurting from getting the inflammation down. We can keep moving we can lose some weight if we are the, I don't want to say typical lipedema lady because typical isn't a word that fits lipedema because mm. we're also different. But when we recognize that we have it, that we have this fat disorder, when we find people to help us, we can feel better because it's painful and it's painful in different ways. Some people have pain in their legs. I mean, the minute something touches them, it hurts. I found that mine hurt when there was just a little bit too much pressure. Like if a, if I sat a baby on my lap, it would hurt. My hurt, legs hurt. Or if I sat on the floor, the floor was too hard, made my legs hurt. I also found that my legs hurt when I walked because they were so heavy. Mm -hmm. They just ached. And I would think, someday I don't want my legs to hurt. And I was actually at that point where I thought, they'll never stop hurting. My journey didn't start to take care of my legs. My journey started to make sure I didn't end up in the bottom of a canyon somewhere dead. And it ended up taking this amazing turn. Maybe it was the turn it was supposed to take from the very beginning, but I didn't know. I keep my ears open. I keep my heart open. I keep my my thought open to the people who are out there, the professionals, the scientists, the engineers, the podcasters, the doctors who are all out there giving us this information. They're giving it to us. Take it. Learn from it. Use it. Share it. I know Dr. Fung always says, the first rule about fasting club is to not talk about fasting club. He used to say that. And I'm like, that's bullpucky. <laughs> I'm talking about it. I'm talking about it because somebody talked to me about it. Mm. Right. I mean, if, if someone would have said, Hey, Gail, there's this person called Dr. Fung. If one person didn't do that, my journey would be different. It was important for that person. I can't even tell you who it was. But it was important for them to say that to me at that time. And it was important for me to be ready to listen to it. And I know that every one of us, we need to open our thoughts to new adventures. And if it doesn't work, you know, give it a month, give it two, give it three. If it doesn't work, go a different direction. But keep going. You know, I, I do see women who say, I've tried for three weeks and it doesn't seem to be working. And I think, yeah, three weeks. But baby, you got to keep going because mm. three weeks is a blip in our life. I mean, I'm, I'm 60 and I'm young. And I'm seeing these women who are in their 70s who are going, oh, my gosh, 
I think I have lipedema. That's what's going on. We just have heard from Dr. Roxon that there's been a biomarker mm -hmm. that they've discovered to help us find out more about lipedema. And that's fascinating. That's new. That's breaking. You know, that's, that's amazing that there can be a blood test that tells us that we have lipedema. Wow. When we have doctors who are telling us, you're just fat. And then I think about all these women who have been fighting their whole lives and no one's listening to them. And we know there's something wrong with our bodies. We know it because we don't think this is normal. You know, we don't think that, oh, yeah, I'm just the fat girl. We're going, yeah, what is this? My friends don't look like this. They lose weight. I can't lose weight. My friend's legs don't look like tree trunks. You know, there's something wrong here. And so we've been fighting for so long and no one's been listening. And so we're so grateful. I am so grateful to Catherine Sayo and Leslie Key. They are amazing. And all the, all the women, Karen Herbst, all the women out there who are helping us. And I'm grateful for the doctors and the scientists. Like I say, the podcasters, the, the engineers who are helping us learn and helping, helping this become a movement, not just for the lipedemas, lippy ladies, but for all of us mm. to learn about metabolic health. I'm just grateful for everybody who's out there. That's right. There's not been a better time to be able to access all that information and learn about yourself and empower yourself. Right. with that knowledge to take control of your own health that's yeah, that's what I love about it that's what often comes out of conversations I have just this feeling of empowerment and there's suddenly sort of this light bulb moment it's not my fault this is what's going on I understand my body now and I can <laughs> yeah. I can take control rather than feeling that food controlled me or right. whatever it was that's fantastic yeah. it's been fantastic talking to you today girl and I I look forward to the next stage in your career and life development and self-discovery it's all fascinating and very very exciting <laughs> thank you Daisy um I tell you when when we made connection on Facebook the other day I went oh yeah <laughs> I get to talk to Daisy I was so <laughs> excited <laughs> so excited i immediately was like sending out messages um it's like i told my husband this morning you know doing my face i said i know she's not gonna you know <laughs> i know no one's gonna see me but i get to i get to meet daisy Brackenhall. hall i'm so excited so you know it was it was two keto dudes that first got me pointed your direction too so i'm i'm grateful for Richard and Carl at that point too. So. Yeah, it's all their fault. That's where it yeah, started. Yeah, it is all their fault. <laughs> they did. They, hey, like my dad used to say, they done good. They did. <laughs> they did good. They very much did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what happens next. I <laughs> Perhaps do. you could leave us with a top tip. I've been thinking a lot about this because immediately I thought, oh, I got to have a top tip, <laughs> and my top tip is. To love your legs. Those legs have carried you many, many, many miles. When you sit down, they create a lap for either your children, your loved ones, your puppies, your crochet work. Something sits on that lap of yours. Even if it's a book or it's your calm hands, something sits on that lap. Your legs are amazing. For all the lipedema ladies out there, your legs are amazing. They're fabulous. They deserve your love. They deserve your care. They deserve your compassion because they've worked hard for you. Your arms, if you have lipedema in your arms, those great big arms give the best hugs. <laughs> People, when you get a chance to hug somebody again, because I know some of us can't hug anybody right now because we're isolated, give the people you love, give your animals, your pets, give them hugs with those great big, huge bear arms. You know, they love them. And if you can't hug anybody else, hug yourself. Just wrap your arms around you and use those arms, wrap them around your legs. 
because your body deserves your love. I love it. That's it. As somebody who um, has not had a love affair with her legs <laughs> for, for the whole of her life, that's a very good. That's a very good top tip. I shall take that to heart. Thank you very much, girl. It has been a very great pleasure. Thanks, Daisy. I look forward to seeing you again. Me too. My love goes out to you. Back at you. <laughs> To get the resources and links from this show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash episodes. Please share this podcast with as many people as possible by sharing one of my links or just taking a screenshot of an episode that you enjoyed. Reviews really help raise the profile of the podcast, which gets it in front of more people, but also helps me attract a wide variety of guests. So please take a minute to leave a review on whichever podcast app or platform you like to listen on. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support really does mean the world to me. Thank you. Are you enjoying this podcast? Help me make more episodes and videos by making a pledge at my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash keto woman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. Don't forget to join in the fun on the Keto Woman Podcast Instagram and Facebook pages and Daisy underscore Keto Woman on Twitter. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you would like to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. This week's end quote is from Theodore Roosevelt. Courage is not having the strength to go on. It is going on when you don't have the strength. Bye-bye, keto lovelies. Bye-bye.